hello, friends. Uh, just wanted to record another video today on the material that we're studying. As I've been going over this material myself, the thing that has really stood out to me about particularly the things that we're talking about in First and Second Kings is the incredible manifestation of priesthood power that were shown in these uh, verses. Um, particularly, I'm talking about the chapters that speak of Elijah and Elisha. I mean, there's, there, there are too many things to go into in, in much detail, but I just want to briefly review some of the incredible manifestations of priesthood power from, uh, from both of these men. Now, now, first, Elijah, his name means Jehovah is my God. So when you contrast Elijah and his name to the whole house of Israel at this point, there's a stark contrast because Elijah, uh, if his name, you know, and, uh, we surely know that his name was indicative of his actual beliefs, he knew who the Lord was. Even when Israel, by and large, did not and had created for themselves a new God whom they worshipped. Um, and that's just by twisting and morphing uh, the characteristics of God into another God uh, who they called Baal and whom the Canaanites worshipped as Baal as well, which again just means the Lord. It's just not translated. So they had twisted Jehovah into something else and they were worshipping that instead. Now Elijah knew who the Lord was and as a result, he had incredible power. I mean, he, right out, right out of the gate, Elijah seals the heavens so that there's no rain in the northern kingdom of Israel. And there's a terrible drought, you know, as a result of that. Through this drought, he's sustained by ravens uh, in a miraculous uh, fashion. He goes to the widow of Zarephath's house and he blesses her. I mean, this is a, an incredible story wherein the widow of Zarephath, she has no food herself. I mean, she's getting ready to make her last little meal for her and her child. And then she supposes that she's going to starve to death herself. And here comes Elijah and asks her, listen, make me a little cake first. And if you do this, then the Lord will bless you. And the Lord does bless her. Her meal and oil, um, they do not fail during the entire famine. So you know, that's another incredible uh, miracle that happens. Her son dies of sickness and Elijah is able to bring uh, her son back to life. Also during these uh, chapters, we have the incredible uh, experience where Elijah confronts the 400 priests of Baal. And we also learn that there are 450 priests of Ashtaroth there priests of the groves, and you know, they can't get their God to listen uh, to them and to accept their sacrifice. And of course, Elijah is able to get the Lord to listen to him, and he consumes not only his sacrifice, but the rock upon which you know, the sacrifice uh, was offered. And of course, it was doused in uh, a lot of water, and that was also you know, taken up. Then you, um, Jezebel seeks uh, Elijah's life. And so he flees into the wilderness and the Lord gives him, or an angel of the Lord gives Elijah a meal that is able to sustain him for 40 days and 40 nights. And Elijah is, you know, transverses the wilderness of Sinai. He gets to Mount Horeb, this the same mount where uh, God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses and the children of Israel, which is known as the first covenant, right? And he's there, and he's, he's very depressed at the state of Israel, the covenant people, how they've abandoned the Lord. And he asks the Lord, Lord, take me. I'm done. Yeah, there's, I'm alone now. There are no other righteous uh, people in Israel. Please just take me. And this is you know, when the Lord appears to Elijah, not in a earthquake or a fire or a mighty wind, but in a still small voice. And one of the things that he tells him is, Elijah, there's still 7,000 people in Israel that are righteous. And 
he asks Elijah to go and get Elisha. And so that's that's what uh, the very next thing that Elijah does is he goes and he finds Elisha. And when he finds Elisha, Elisha is plowing his fields. He has 12 oxen, obviously representative of the 12 tribes of Israel. And as soon as Elijah puts his mantle upon Elisha, Elisha says, okay, yeah, of course, I'm going to follow you. So that, that tells us that Elisha is one of these 7,000 um, righteous people in Israel. This is the northern kingdom of Israel we're talking about. And in fact, Elisha slays some of his oxen and he feeds the people that are with him. And we learn that the people that are with him are called by a, the, geez, uh, Spanish word just came, came to my mind instead of the English word. Uh, they, uh, it's a group of people and they go by the name of the sons of the prophets. And, you know, he, he feeds them with his slain oxen, and then he starts following Elijah after that. And he takes on, you know, that mantle in, in incredible ways. And he is very faithful to Elijah. Elijah tells him at one point, okay, Elisha, you need to stay here. The Lord's called me in another way, and I'm going to go. And Elisha says, no way. I, I'm not going to be separated from you. And he follows him wherever he goes. And ultimately they come, you know, there's, there's various groups of prophets that come up to him and they say, hey, you know, Elijah is going to be taken from you today. And he says, yes, I, I know it. And when they get to the river Jordan, Elijah, you know, hits the water with his mantle and it divides and they walk across on dry ground. And then he turns to Elisha and says, Elisha, what do you want? Ask for whatever you want from me, and I'll, I'll give it to you if I can. And what Elisha, of course, asks for is that he receive a double portion of the spirit that had empowered Elijah. And Elijah tells him, hey, listen, you're asking for a very hard thing. In other words, hey, you're asking for something that I can't give you. You know, this is, Elijah is not working by his own power. He's working by the Lord's power. And so he tells him, listen, if you see the manner in which the Lord takes me up into heaven, then you'll know that the Lord is going to give you what you asked for. And of course, Elisha sees this fiery chariot descend from heaven and pick Elijah up and carry him up into heaven alive. So Elijah becomes translated. And we learn that you know, later on, Elijah returns. And he returns you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration and bestows certain keys upon Peter, James, and John. And he also returns in the last days to Joseph Smith and restores the priesthood, certain priesthood keys, um, the sealing power specifically to Joseph Smith. So Elisha sees this and he receives you know, that mantle. And when he goes, he hits the uh, River Jordan again and it divides and he walks through on dry ground. And, you know, both of these men, I mean, they did incredible things. I mean, the things that I've talked about so far are incredible. But Elijah also, I mean, there was a time where you know, there were 50 men, soldiers that were coming to get him and take him by force to the king. And uh, Elijah commands fire to come down from heaven and consume them, and it does. And that happens more than once. And, you know, Elisha commands animals and they do his will. He stops poison from hurting people. He also, Elisha, raises people from the dead. He heals Naaman the Syrian from leprosy. He causes other people to get leprosy. He helps, you know, people that are his disciples, their eyes to be opened so that he can, they can see that those that are with, you know, the people of the Lord are more than those that oppose him. And on the other hand, he causes entire army, armies of the Syrians to be blind so that they cannot see what's really in front of them. So these are incredible manifestations of priesthood power. But I think to really understand this, and the key takeaway for me from these chapters is not the incredible priesthood power that was given to both Elijah and Elisha, but the circumstances under which that priesthood power was conveyed. So what are the circumstances? So we learn early on in the story of Elijah that you know he 
um, he's confronted with you know a man who is trying to get him to come and talk to the king of the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, Ahab. And this man's name is Obadiah. And we know that the scripture says Obadiah was a man who feared the Lord. And because he feared the Lord, he took a hundred prophets and hid them in a cave and fed them. So there's a couple of things that are that really stand out to, to me. And this is it's indicative of what's really happening here. And I think that this context is very important for us to understand. Why were there so many prophets? Why were there a hundred prophets that Obadiah could find? And why did he have to save them? So let's talk about these two different you know, questions. First, why were there a hundred prophets? I mean, prophets, the way that we talk about prophets are few and far between. I mean, we talk about there being 15 prophets, seers, and revelators on the earth that we sustain. There's a hundred that Obadiah, you know, is, you know, saving. So we understand that this hundred is a, you know, a portion of a larger subset. There's, there were more prophets than just these, this hundred that Obadiah was able to, to save. In fact, in, in other occasions, you know, large groups of the sons of the prophets come out and are talking to, you know, Elisha. In fact, Elisha, in another miracle that happened, remember the swimming axe ad? Well, that happened when Elisha was building a compound with the sons of the prophets. In other words, there were people that saw the prophets, um, prophets such as Elisha that had a, a mantle of power, and they followed them. Uh, in so much that they became known as the sons of the prophets. I mean, the, the same thing happens in Judah as well. And you can read about, you know, something very similar in uh, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 19, verse 20, we learn about this group. Um, I think it's called the Council of Prophets or something like that. But they see Samuel as having a prophetic mantle, and they follow Samuel. And they hang on Samuel's every word, just like the sons of the prophets hung on Elijah and Elisha's every word. So I think that this is interesting because there's examples where the sons of the prophets, you know, I mean, they're doing incredible things too. And so th this is very interesting. But the fact that Obadiah has to hide these men in a cave means that they're being persecuted. And... We need to understand, you know, what a prophet is in the in this sense of the word, and the best way to understand this is from the book of Revelation. Uh, I believe this is in Revelation nineteen verse ten. It talks about how anyone who has a testimony of Jesus Christ receives it through the spirit of prophecy, and so these people were prophets in that they knew who the God of Israel was. They didn't worship Baal. Uh, in another instance, in the book of Numbers, I think this is in Numbers 11, 29, um, Joshua is upset because in the camps of Israel, there's two men and they're prophesying. And he goes to Moses and he, he says, Moses, there's, there's these men and they're prophesying. We got to stop them. You're the prophet. And what Moses said was very interesting. He says, you know, are you jealous for my sake? I would to God that every man in Israel had the spirit of the Lord and could prophesy. I were that you were all prophets. So what we're talking about are people that know the Lord. And when we're talking about prophets, we're using this as a general term. In ancient languages, typically when you use the masculine form of a word, it's to... It, it, in first women as well. We certainly know that uh, there were female prophetesses in the scriptures. I mean, a, a great example of a female prophetess would be Isaiah's wife. Um, Isaiah referred to her as the prophetess. Uh, also, you know, in Second Kings uh, chapter twenty-two, verses uh, verse fourteen, there's a high priest and some other men that go and seek out a prophetess. Um, and she gives them a, an incredible prophecy. 
And interestingly enough, it says that they find her in the college. Other Hebrew translations of the Bible refer to this as um, a study hall. But here we have a woman who is clearly studying the scripture she's reading in a special place for that uh, purpose. You know, something worthy of note, if you look up in the Bible dictionary under the word prophet, you'll find that First and Second Kings and First and Second Samuel, uh, both books that refer to these larger groups of the sons of the prophets and the council of prophets, says that these books were special books, according to the Jews. The Jews say that they were written by people that actually had the prophetic mantle rather than just scribes. And you can see this perspective in First and Second Kings and also in First uh, and Second Samuel, where there seems to be a larger population of people that are referred to as prophets that are able to do things. And they have a testimony of who the God of Israel really is. So at this time in Israel, people who really know who the Lord is, they're being persecuted. And that's why Obadiah had to take a hundred of them and hide them in a cave and support them. And when Obadiah finally meets Elijah, one of the first things that he says is, hey, Elijah, I just want you to know that I'm a good guy. I tried to save the lives of a hundred prophets. And what Elijah tells to him, tells him is very interesting. He, or, or shortly after he hears that, he refers to himself as being a, the alone in Israel, um, the only prophet. So to me, that means that these men that Obadiah had, had seen and was, was trying to help, that they had either been killed or that they had to flee the northern kingdom of Israel altogether. So this is a period of great struggle and persecution and opposition for the saints of God in Israel. And I think that it's because of this persecution that you have such an incredible manifestation of power, priesthood power, that's unlike you know, other times in Israel's history. So I want, I want to show you something. Um, as I was you know, studying these things, I just had the impression that I should look up in the scriptures what a saint was. I'm not talking about the definition of a saint. Let's, let's just come to the scriptures, and I'm going to try to just search for the word saint. Saints. So I'm here in the Book of Mormon. Let's, let's just start reading some of these at random. So let's go to the, the first one. 1 Nephi 13, verse 5. And behold, the angel said unto me, Behold the formation of a church, a church which is most abominable above all other churches, which slayeth the saints of God, and tortureth them, and bindeth them down, and yoketh them with a yoke of iron, and bringeth them down into captivity. Okay? That's one instance, one scripture that uses the word saint. Look at the next scripture. And also for the praise of the world do they destroy the saints of God and bring them down into captivity. See a similarity here? Let's let's you know scroll down, you know. Let's see, let's go to 35. <clears throat> let's see, let's read this first one. And behold that great city Moroniha have I covered with the earth and the inhabitants thereof, to hide their iniquities and their abominations from before my face, that the blood of the prophets and the saints shall not come any more against me. You know, we look at the next one. This is it, another one. The blood of the prophets and the saints shall not come any more against me. These are listing a bunch of cities that were destroyed because you know, they were persecuting and killing the saints. Let's look at uh, let's look at Ether chapter 1, see what this one says. Um, or Ether 8, 22, and Whatsoever nation shall uphold such secret combinations to get power and gain until they shall spread over the nation, behold, they shall be destroyed. For the Lord will not suffer that the blood of his saints, which shall be shed by them, shall always cry unto him from the ground for vengeance upon them. Yet he avenged them not. So, you know, I've just read a couple of these scriptures at random, um, and you can see that there seems to be a commonality when the term saint is being used, it is being used for a group of people that have been persecuted because they know who the Lord is and they will not abandon their faith in the Lord. 
to me, it seems like this persecution may be indeed what it, what makes a saint a saint. So when you think about that, when you think about the name of our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and you look at what happened to the early members of this church who were driven from their homes, who lost all of their possessions, who had an extermination order um, written by the governor of Missouri to kill them if they would not leave the state voluntarily. I mean, you can, you can see the similarities between what was going on in First and Second Kings as well as you know, the prophecies about what will happen in the last days. So to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and to really be a saint means that you will be willing to take upon you the name of the Lord, whatever the cost. Now, uh, let me go back to, um, I know that there's a, a, a specific verse, and I didn't read this one. I think that it's, yeah, let's read this one. First Nephi chapter 14, verse 14. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth. And they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. So Nephi saw that in the last days, when the saints were going to be oppressed, and believe me, the saints will be oppressed. We're not experiencing that oppression right now, certainly not to the degree that you know our forefathers experienced it, but we will. <clears throat> we know that when the Antichrist comes on the scene, that he will wage a war against the saints and that he will overcome the saints and prevail upon them. I think about this kind of like the people of Alma when the Lamanites came and conquered them and they were oppressed and there was nothing that they could do, or the people of Limhi who tried to fight their way to freedom and oh, each time they did, they were defeated with a great slaughter in so much that they, they had hardly any men and you know, they were totally subjected and to the Lamanites and they were only delivered through the miraculous power of God. And you know, the same with the people of Alma. That's going to happen again. And in these times, throughout the history of the scriptures, particularly in First and Second Kings, but not only there, when the people of the Lord that know who he is and trust in him, even when the masses abandon him. Now, let's just think about this for, for a minute. The northern kingdom of Israel, the Lord has just told us, that there are 7,000 righteous people still in the kingdom of Israel. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel was comprised of at least 10 tribes. Now, 500 years before this time, just the men of fighting age counted over 600,000. So now there has to be, you know, multi-millions of people in Israel. And yet, there are only 7,000 of those that know who the Lord is, really know him. And those people were endowed with a power. They were known as the sons of the prophets. And they could do things that nobody else could do. And we just read that passage in 1 Nephi 14, 14, where Nephi said, hey, when the saints are persecuted in the last day, they will also be endowed with power. So this is, this is important for us to understand. Because when there is incredible opposition, the Lord also gives greater blessings. So in the vein of what the people, the righteous people, the 7,000 people were doing in Israel, meaning when they saw a man with a prophetic mantle, they lived by every word that came out of his mouth. Contrast that to everybody else in Israel who couldn't care less. Well, what is our prophet saying to us today? Do we listen to him 
in the same way that the sons of the prophets listened to Elijah or the council of prophets listened to Samuel? Um, you know, that's a, that is a good question to, to ask yourself. I have uh, compiled a bunch of quotes from our prophet, and I just wanted to, to read a couple of these. You know, I, th I think that uh, you'll find them eye-opening. So this, this first quote is President Nelson speaking to sisters. Listen to what he says to them. Sisters, how I yearn for you to understand that the restoration of the priesthood is just as relevant to women as it is to men. Sisters, you have the right to draw liberally upon the Savior's power to help your family and others you love. The Holy Ghost will be your personal tutor as you seek to understand what the Lord would have you do. Your personal spiritual endeavor will bring you joy as you gain, understand, and use the power with which you have been endowed. Now, with, with that quote, these are some of my personal notes. Um, I made a, a note of 2nd Esdras, uh, 2nd Esdras 1633 through 40. I want to read to you what that, what that verse says, because this is very interesting that the prophet of the Lord is talking to the sisters and telling them, hey, listen, the priesthood has to do with you as well. Listen to what, as, listen to what Second Esdras says the last days will be like. This is 2nd Esther's chapter 16, beginning in verse 33. The virgins shall mourn, having no bridegrooms. The women shall mourn, having no husbands. Their daughters shall mourn, having no helpers. In the wars, their bridegrooms shall be destroyed, and their husbands shall perish because of famine. Hear now these things, and understand them, ye servants of the Lord. Behold the word of the Lord, receive it, and believe not the gods of whom the Lord spake. For there shall be in every place and in the next cities a great insurrection upon those that fear the Lord. They shall be like madmen, sparing none, but still spoiling and destroying those that fear the Lord. For they shall waste and take away their goods and cast them out of their houses. Then shall they be known who are my chosen, the saints. And they shall be tried as gold in the fire. Hear, O ye, my beloved, saith the Lord. Behold, the days of trouble are at hand but I will deliver you from the same. So in this passage in 2nd Ezra, Ezra is seeing a period of time that to me sounds very similar to Lemhi's people where the men were killed and you have a large population of, of women and they're going to need priesthood power. So our prophet is telling women that they need to study priesthood power. So that's, that, is, that is very interesting. Now there's you know, another note that I made here, uh, Jeremiah 31, 22. And in this, I mean, if you read the context of the, the previous verses, you'll see that uh, it's talking about the last days. It's talking about Ephraim in the last days. And it's talking about when the house of Israel will be restored to its ancestral lands. And it says that in those days that the Lord will do a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. In other translations of that passage, it says a woman will protect a man. So in other words, women are going to become, through the power of the Lord, powerful and enabled through you know, the Lord himself, just like, you know, First Nephi 14, 14 says, that is talking about the saints, which is a general group, not men or, or priesthood men. Um, so let, let's, let's go ahead and look at, you know, this, the second quote, you know, that stood out to me about what President Nelson said. Study and pray to learn more about the power and knowledge with which you have been endowed or with which you will yet be endowed. He knows that the day is coming, like just like 1 Nephi 14, 14 says, when the saints will be armed with the power of God in great glory. And he's asking us to learn and study more about this. Note that he's not just telling us what to do. He's telling us to make a study of these things for ourselves. Um, let's look at uh, another quote from 
uh, him. Make time to study his words. Really study. If you truly love your family and if you desire to be exalted with them throughout eternity, pay the price now through serious study and fervent prayer to know these eternal truths and then to abide by them. He wants us to learn these things. He's telling us that we can learn these things. But we need to take the initiative and go out and start studying them. I know that a lot of people don't know where to begin when it comes to this kind of thing. And, you know, I, I understand, you know, where you're, you're coming from on that. It took me a long time to, you know, understand these things myself. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons that I have written the books that I have written uh, in the manner in which I wrote them. You know, they're really more like scripture guides and they, they just list, you know, many, many scriptures that talk about these things to try to show you what the scriptures say. And then I, you know, I talk about them. In all of my books, I mean, the scriptures are front and center because that's, that's the source. And that's where we need to go to learn about these things. That's what the prophet is saying. Go take the time to study these things for yourself. Now, let's look at another thing that uh, he said that stood out to me. Again, in this passage, he's talking to sisters. I invite you, my dear sisters, to create a home that is a place of security. Increase your understanding of priesthood power and of temple covenants and blessings. Having places of security to which you can retreat will help you embrace the future with faith. I mean, one thing that has really impressed me about President Nelson is he has always been two steps ahead. And, you know, I, I think that we will find that he is absolutely two steps ahead when it comes to all of these things as well. We should be studying and preparing ourselves. And just like the sons of the prophets in First and Second Kings, we should be seeking to know the Lord, really know the Lord, and being instructed by him and hanging on the words of our you know, modern day prophet and not just hearing his words, but doing what he asks us to do. There are many, more, many other things that I could you know, say. I, I think I have 10 pages of these quotes uh, from him, which you know, are, you know, I, I think they're, they're all amazing. Let me just read a couple, a couple more. Um, here's, uh, I'm going to go to six here. Satan and his minions will constantly contrive roadblocks to prevent you from understanding the spiritual gifts with which you have been and can be blessed. I entreat you to study prayerfully all the truths you can find about priesthood power. You might begin with Doctrine and Covenants section 25, 84, and 107. These sections will lead you to other passages. The scriptures and teachings by modern prophets, seers, and revelators are filled with these truths. As you understand, as your understanding increases and you exercise faith in the Lord and his priesthood power, your ability to draw upon this spiritual treasure that the Lord has made available will increase. So the, the prophet wants us to be anxiously engaged in this. He doesn't expect us to just wait to be told everything that we're supposed to do. In fact, the common thread in all of these passages that, that I have read or quotes from the prophet so far, is that the onus of learning these things is upon us, not upon him. He is pointing us in the right direction, telling us what we should be looking at, what we should be doing. But it's up to us to listen to him and to take the time to study. Here, here's a couple of more quotes. I would like to leave a blessing upon you that you may understand the priesthood power with which you have been endowed, and that you will augment that power by exercising your faith in the Lord and in his power. Another one. I promise that as you increase your capacity to receive revelation, the Lord will bless you with increased direction for your life and with boundless gifts of the Spirit. I mean, is there any doubt that he expects us to be seeking and searching rather than just be being spoon-fed these truths. The Lord has said he will bless us with great power. And I know that he will. I mean, you, when you look at other examples, not just in First and Second Kings, I mean, you look at the people of Melchizedek, 
they were surrounded by the Canaanites before the Israelites got there. And rather than being asked to destroy the Israelites, they were preserved through miraculous power. I mean, you can read Genesis chapter 14, uh, specifically the Joseph Smith translation of that chapter, and you'll learn more about those things. Also, you know, the city of Enoch, they were surrounded by unrighteousness, and they were preserved through miraculous priesthood power in the last days. Remember, Nephi also said that the righteous have no need to fear, for they will be preserved, even if it so be, as by fire. So the righteous people will be preserved. When we read these scriptures about there being so many women in the last days and not very many men, yeah, that's an indicator, <laughs> an indication that you know, men need to get with the program. And you know, women tend to be more receptive to the Lord, and that needs to change. And if it doesn't change, if men don't start you know, taking upon them their priesthood mantles, then you know, they're not going to be around. You know, they're going to be you know, swept off the face of this land and all lands. And those that were willing to carry those mantles will be around during the most incredible time in this earth's history when Israel is restored and the Lord is personally upon the earth. And, you know, during the millennium, it's not like there's going to be, you know, vastly, you know, skewed ratios of men to women because Israel will be repopulated from, you know, these righteous uh, 10 tribes that will be returning. And so we have the opportunity to join them in the mirac most miraculous events that, you know, have ever taken place on the uh, history of the earth. Or, you know, we can, you know, be looking at this period of time on the other side of the veil with weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. In fact, Jesus Christ referred to these you know, the events that transpired in First and Second Kings uh, during his ministry when he was talking to the Israelites and he said, hey, listen, there were many lepers in Israel, but unto none of them did, you know, none of them were healed, save it be Naaman the Syrian. And there were many widows in Israel, but unto none of those uh, was Elijah commanded to go, except for to um, the widow of Zarephath, who was not an Israelite. And then it goes on to say that uh, you know, the amongst the children of the kingdom, there will be much uh, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Meaning, you know, you're not in the club just because you your forefathers made the covenant and you have made that same covenant from a social perspective. That's not what what makes you a covenant person. What makes you a covenant person is anxiously striving to keep the covenants that you have made and to know the Lord and to follow him and to be taught by him. That's what made these people special in First and Second Kings. It's what makes saints saints. And it's what we need to do to be able to survive the coming days. So I just wanted to share these parallels from, you know, the first couple of Sundays in Preach My Gospel because I think that there are, you know, tremendous parallels with what we're reading and studying in the Old Testament and what is going to transpire in our day. And we, we're meant to catch these parallels and to study them and to learn from them. And, you know, it's, it's my prayer that, you know, each of us is seeking to know the Lord and making a diligent study of not just these things, but of what the Lord would have us no. He wants us to know about the covenants that are going to be fulfilled in the last days. In fact, you know, that's, that's another one of the things that uh, President Nelson has said on uh, numerous times. He, he has said, listen, the gathering of Israel is the most important thing going on on the earth today. And I remember one conference when he asked us to study the covenants that the Lord has made with the house of Israel. And that if we did, that we'd be amazed. And then he asked us to look for their fulfillment in our lives. But, you know, very few people took him up on that. Just like very few people have taken him up on studying about priesthood power and the importance of knowing the Lord. I hope that we can be more like the sons and daughters of the prophets 
and know the Lord so that we can be prepared when the time comes to be endowed with this same you know, mantle and power that the saints in you know, these chapters were endowed because we're going to need it if we're going to survive uh, what's coming. And you know, I, I hope that this has been helpful to you. And you know, if if not, sorry about it. But uh, um, hopefully, you you found something that's resonated with you. And that's the that's the most important thing. That if the Lord has touched your heart, you know, as I've been speaking, that you that you look into investigate further those things that He's you know whispered to you. And, you know, until next time, friends, you know, keep the faith and God bless.